Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> Welcome into another Vegas Squares podcast, because Aaron's too fucking lazy to start this. I'm Spike, and I am apparently taking over on mic one today. Uh, We are, I guess, full studio now, because we kind of trimmed the fat, so to speak. This is our full studio. Yeah, so it's just the two of us hanging out, talking all sorts of topics, which I probably should have the topics list in front of me. Yeah, you're you're mic one now. Well, you didn't... Fucking tell me that until two seconds before you turn the recorder on. I'm so spontaneous, now, bitch. No, I gotta no, figure I, out what I have we're doing a here. public service announcement oh, for everybody God. out yeah, there. Yeah, go. Don't ever take the second sleeping gummy unless you plan on sleeping for a full day. <laughs> <laughs> I am exhausted right now. Like I am mentally and physically just beat. I have these uh, CBD gummies that. Um, uh, I've been taking because I I work nights, so sleeping during the day is not, obviously not a natural task for me. Uh, but today I was super tired when I came home, so I was like, you know what, I want to sleep for like ten hours, which I did. But apparently, two gummies means like fifty hours. <laughs> so I am still kind of shaking it all off, trying to get uh, back to normal. I feel like I feel very groggy right now, I, so I, that's why you're on mic one. I can tell now. Why did you decide to go with the CBD instead of like a melatonin or something that was, I don't want to say more natural because all of it's natural, but. Uh, the producer got them. Ah, and she, okay. I, uh, I've tried Ambien. I've tried uh, Z-Quil. I've tried uh, melatonin. Nothing has worked. Really? So um, she's real dive, dived in. Is that She's real dove in. She's real in. To the whole fitness and supplements game with all her Instagram stuff. So someone suggested them to her, and she's got them, and it, I sleep with these. It's the only thing that's ever made me sleep through. The other ones will put me to sleep two hours, I'm up, you know, I'm kind of up and down. And these ones, I take one, six to eight hours, no big deal. Damn, all right. But I wanted to sleep for like 10, 12 hours a day because I got home about 8 a.m. And I'm like, I want to sleep all the way until it's time to record. And uh, I pretty much did. I mean, when you text me like, when are we doing this? I'm like, well, I just woke up. God damn. <laughs> so um, they are, not to do some product placement unless they want to sponsor us, but they are CBD brand gummies. The the brand is Ollie, O-L-L-Y. Huh. They taste like shit, but they work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not exactly a wonderful uh, endorsement for them, so I don't I think... I chew them as fast as I can. I, I don't think they're going to be calling us anytime soon. But. Well, I don't think they will either, but I mean, I, I think I think they're more focused on effectiveness than taste. Because, okay. like, if something works, I'll I'll, uh, I'll hold back my nose and, and chew it real quick, but that's like protein powder. I think protein powder tastes like shit. All those different, you know, they, oh, yeah. chocolate, banana, peanut, they all taste like shit. But if I chug it real quick, then... I get the yeah. energy you need. The pre-made ones I, I've liked. Pre-made uh, protein drinks as opposed to doing the shakes. I've heard they have like uh, artificial sugars and stimulants and like xylitol and all that crap. Uh, I mean, not the ones that I've been taking. Mm. I mean, I'll, I, I can double check the ingredients, but I mean, it's uh, like one gram of sugar, which is nothing. I prefer my uh, pre-workout be a bacon grilled breakfast burrito from Taco Bell. <laughs> that gets you where you need to go. <laughs> Lovely. All right, Mike, we're yeah. back. All right, so yeah, I guess uh, I guess we got to talk actual sports stuff, which I didn't prepare for at all. So let's uh, figure out what we're supposed to do. Oh, the new uh, collective bargaining agreement in the NFL. So yeah, it's been proposed. It's been approved by the owners. Approved by the owners. The question is, will the uh, the Players Association agree. You're doing great, by the way. Yeah, well, you know, I'm trying to... <laughs> I know, this is awesome. Uh, I'm also trying to deposit on WSOP.com because my balance is at 12 cents because I, I want to say... You're good at poker. I was going to say, I, 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 I want to say that online poker is rigged, but it's not. But now fucking PayPal is giving me trouble because PayPal is utter dog shit. So... Uh, All right, I'll take over my Yeah, one. go ahead. <laughs> so, yes, it was... Uh, it was announced earlier this week that the NFL owners have approved the new CBA deal, leaving basically the decision now in the 
player representatives' hands, all 32 of them, I guess. I didn't, I didn't realize there was a, a kind of a panel. I, I mean, maybe I did. I just didn't think about it. I, I didn't realize there was a panel of a player from each of the 32 teams uh, makes up the NFLPA with, obviously, D. D Maurice Smith, if, or however you say that name. Uh, but within the collective bargaining agreement has been plans to expand the schedule to uh, a 17-game regular season, which has been uh, divisive, so to speak, because obviously the players don't want more games without more money. And then the other thing uh, that's largely based in this, in this uh, CBA agreement is the new playoff format. So let's start there. Um, we'll start with the 17-game schedule. Obviously, as fans of the NFL, first initial thought is, well, that's great. Let's go for more games. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, we all want to see more games. We know that it's going to bring in more money because even with, you know, it, it's more games, but it's not because now it, it's still 20 total games between preseason and regular season now instead of 4 and 16, it's 3 and 17. Well, right. It's not more actual games, but I mean, let's be honest. I can't remember the last preseason game I watched. Right, and that, I think that's kind of the point that the owners are making is that it's... Uh, uh, they want to have another game that actually matters because that's more butts in the seats, that's more attention to the team, that's bigger TV ratings, that's you know everything else they want. Obviously, player safety is a concern. One of the proposals that I had heard a couple of years ago that doesn't seem to have been on the table this time around, but it was out of concern for player safety but in order to appease the owners to get more games, it was an 18-game schedule, but every player could only play up to 16 games. Yes, I did. I remember hearing about that, and I also remember hearing that an additional bye week would be implemented Yes, as well. yeah, yeah, they would have to do that. Yeah, they'd have to expand rosters for that, which obviously would mean more people on your team, right. which would obviously mean a bigger salary cap, I would imagine. Right, which would also kill like the XFL and you know any of those fledgling. Uh, maybe leagues. yes, maybe no, because they're played at different times. The question would be is if free agents, uh, current NFL free agents, were allowed to play in the XFL as a showcase. Well, I mean, obviously not like current NFL free agents like Tom Brady, but you know, an NFL free agent who their contract isn't renewed and they're not 100% sure if they're even going to be signed by anybody else. This may be the end of their career, so they may go to the XFL and say, hey, look, remember me? I, I still can play. Mm. You know, maybe, maybe you want me on the Bucks this year as your you know, backup nickel cornerback, just to use a random-ass fucking position. But yeah, That's pretty random. I do remember hearing that. The question is, is... Uh, obviously, we're talking about increased dollars. That's what the owner's fundamental bottom line is, you yes. know, no pun intended, increasing the dollars. But I think the players need to have an increase of dollars as well. Revenue sharing, uh, from what I understand, is pretty close to 50-50 in the NFL. Uh, are you okay if they keep it 50-50, or do you think some should go more to the players if this is the case? Because obviously... Uh, let's just use flat numbers. The league, I think, makes something around $7 billion a year. And let's just say an individual team profits, you know, uh, $1 billion. And I know that with the salary cap and all that jazz, it's supposed to be 50-50. And, again, I'm not a little, I'm not 100% sure how all of that works, especially when there is a hard salary cap. But if we're talking about increased revenue share, I'm all for the players, and I'm not usually a players guy in, in terms of this. I know I'm in the minority usually most of the time with that. I'm all for the players actually getting an increase in salary. However, I'm asking for it to be not where Patrick Mahomes now gets $60 million, but the other guys are now, the league minimum goes up to a million. Mm. I, I mean, you're right. The the pay maybe not a million. I'm just using numbers. Right, right. No, I I get what you're saying. But yeah, no, I I I agree with you that the pay has to go up because not only are you asking the players to spend more time in the games, but they have to spend more times training, more times at the facility, more times away from their family, and that sure. has to be compensated in some way, shape, or form. Mm. Uh, so I, I I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it could get to a point where. It, 
I, I think in the initial rounds or the initial collective bargaining agreement, they wouldn't change the revenue sharing model because they would want to see if the new system works before they would want to change the the way that the payments are structured. Which is fair, but I I, I don't and I don't know how ironclad or concrete the CBA is. But I think once you sign it, you're kind of stuck. That was the whole thing with. When Roger Goodell, when the, the players awarded Roger Goodell almost judge, jury, executioner power, they regretted it by, like, year two. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, you know, these... C- I don't know if they wrote a clause in there with that. Yeah, I'm sure no- these CB- CBAs could have a little bit of negotiating wiggle room. Yeah, I, I mean, none of the CBAs last forever, so, you know, when, when they expire, then they can But do what that. economists in their right mind... Well, yes, this, this expires ten years from now, or they're usually around a ten-year deal. Yeah. But what economists in their right mind would, would say, okay, you take away two preseason games turn them into regular season games, that's going to lose money. I mean, no economist would ever back that theory. Yeah, of course not. So i got to imagine that you would already know ahead of time you're going to have an increase in revenue. Because, yes, yes, preseason tickets do cost the same as regular season tickets, especially if you're a season ticket holder. But, what you said, butts in the seats for preseason games, that's merchandise, that's alcohol sales, that's food sales that aren't happening. So that's the increased revenue for those two games because – those seats are sold. Pretty much the entire stadium's full with season ticket holders and 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 the third party and the resales they can get money from. They're 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 selling out these preseason games, at least from what I understand. The money that they make in, when the person gets there is what they're missing out in preseason games. So I would imagine once that's a regular season game, I'm I'm not skipping. I'm not skipping week one just because it used to be a preseason game. Oh, yeah, no. I, I, so now I'm yeah. there, I buy a beer, I buy two, I buy my kid a foam finger, I buy my kid a, a you know, or I buy me a jersey. Now uh, you're looking at 30, you know, 150, 180, that's 200 bucks I just spent, you know, multiplied by X number of people. Yeah. So the, I think that's where the, 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 the dollars will increase. Is now that the butts are actually in the seats, and, you know, these guys got to have their $15 beers, which, by the way, fuck you, T-Mobile, because they're 17, 16 and 17 now. You're yeah. lucky you don't drink. Yeah. No, that, it, it's, I, I've seen the prices on those things, and I, I'm lucky I don't drink, and I'm lucky I had the stomach surgery, because the, <laughs> the, even the food prices are fucking batshit at yeah, these Yeah, I don't usually eat at an arena, but I will have a beer or two. And I'm pretty confident, because we went to Arizona on President's Day for the Islanders uh, Arizona game. Buddy of mine's in town from New York. Okay. He just left. But uh, theirs were 15 and 16, so it's not like T-Mobile's gouging us, even though they're, they're, they're a little more expensive than what seems to be the trend. Yeah, but I mean, we've talked about it before. We saw the, uh, the, the numbers from the Mercedes-Benz Stadium where they lower concession prices and the owners made more money because more people bought more shit. Correct. So we know that that model works. The problem is... We know that the concession companies or the stadium or the team, you know, whoever is control, in control of food and beverage at these arenas, you know, they're, they're all MBAs. And telling an MBA lower prices, they're going to start kicking and crying like they just told a child you can't have a G.I. Joe. Yes, like, I did see your social media post. Yes, and so <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm reusing that quote from Facebook. But, I mean, it, it's that, it is that principle where trying to tell somebody – who knows a subject, hey, we have a new way of doing things. We have data that shows this new way of doing things may work better. Revenue or profit? Because sometimes revenue is three to one. You know, you might, like you said, if a beer's 18 bucks and, and, I, and then you, you make a beer six bucks, I got to sell three to one ratio to, to break even, which also includes more manpower as well. Sure. And uh, I actually discussed this with, uh, I would agree with you. Probably revenue would increase. But the thing is, is if I, if I have beers for 18 bucks and I'm I'm not trying to debunk your theory, because I I actually tend to, obviously as a civilian, I want $6 beers, Yeah. but as a civilian, I may say I'm going in, I'm having two beers no matter what. And if they're six bucks, most average guy will still drink two beers. Lunky meathead guy will probably drink five. Which yep. he'll be the he'll be the margin that you're seeking. Um, but I may have lost if I if I spend thirty six on two beers or if I spend twelve on two beers and I'm drinking two beers no matter what I just lost they just lost twenty bucks right and, or 
give or take. And, and to answer your question, I, I don't know which way it went, whether it was revenue or profit, but I, I do know that it was a 25% increase in X, and that's, you right. know, I, I don't pay that much attention to finances because that kind of thing doesn't interest me as a researcher. So Right, that, and as a civilian, yeah, right. six, give me $6 beers all day, yeah. I'll probably be the guy who drinks five. But I, I did actually have this argument with somebody specifically about T-Mobile Arena, and he actually told me, that he knows somebody who is a manager at T-Mobile, and for whatever reason, they don't have the storage capacity to keep enough beer around to make cheaper beers reasonable or like uh, doable. So they, they have, don't have the the quantity storage, right? Exactly. To sell as many beers as so they expect to sell. In other words, they almost have to charge that much because they know that no matter what, they're going to get X number of beers sold and X number of dollars and X revenue. number of dollars out of that. But and so they kind of toe the line, like they go up to as expensive as they think they can make it and still get the beer sold. I'm sure. And but if they made it too cheap, they would run out. Because I'm pretty sure in, in year one, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure in year one there were like fourteen dollars a beer, and here in year three. They're three dollars more, which would obviously suggest an increase in th- of a dollar a year. And you're right; if that beer gets up to twenty dollars, they may see a dip in revenue, and they'll they'll obviously correct the market. But uh, we have gotten way off track here. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, back, circle it back around to football. Yes, those butts inside those seats. I mean, you go to a football game. How much do you think, if you had to set a line, how much do you think those beers will be at the Raider Stadium? Seventeen. Uh, apparently, it's the exact same company that Levy? is running the concessions at Levy T-Mobile. Or Aramark? It's Levy. Levy. Uh, so, so they'll be pretty con- on par with yeah. That. So again, uh, these guys. There's some guys that come in there, like myself. You know, if if it's a day that I'm not working that night, I'll go in. I'll say, all right, I'm going to have two beers, and I know I'm spending thirty four dollars on my beer. Yes, the guy who is having two beers no matter what. Wants that because he saves. Well, if they're six dollars, then you know you're from twelve to thirty-four. He's saving twenty-two bucks a game. That's huge. Oh yeah. He may even have a third beer, but you're still down on that guy. Yeah. And that's what I think scares the NBAs. That so you speak. Yes, revenue may be on at an all-time high, but the manpower and the actual dollars at the end may be the same. But I think Arthur Blank, and I believe he owns Mercedes, unless unless the city does. Um, has come out and said uh, with that uh, the one of the bigger reasons that they do so well and they can lower the other concession prices is because uh, Chick-fil-A is in there. And Chick-fil-A pays them a large, hefty sum of money to be in there. Right, and, and that makes sense, although the fact that Chick-fil-A has to be closed on Sundays and most I of their... I think they still serve the sandwiches in there. Do they? Yeah. Okay. Because it's an independent vendor, I think the, I think they send the sandwiches. Uh, from what I heard, because I went to a Saturday game, from what I heard, I think the and, and I can't prove this. I have no evidence to prove this. I think those sandwiches are made on Saturday and sold on Sunday. Interesting. They're still good though. Yeah, oh, <laughs> they're probably I, still good. I mean, they're they're always going to be good. But yeah. uh, uh, what the fuck was I just going to say? I think they about can that. do a Christian loophole with that. We're going to make money. Yeah. Well, and, and, oh, and it, sell. And we're going to we're going to be closed on Sunday, but we're still selling sandwiches in the in the arena. But I mean, that's kind of the thing is that. Every single square inch, every second of every game at Golden Knights games is sponsored to an embarrassing extent. And I've talked about this a little bit. Very much so. Everything's sponsored by something. Yeah, and like the... Uh, a little John crowd noise meter is now sponsored by UMC. Yeah, like the, uh, the the first the the last minute of the period, the second period itself, like yeah, who the the power Credit play, one, yeah. yeah, the power play, the penalty kill, like all of it is sponsored. These sponsors get their names Even mentioned. Small, and and by the way, they need to get rid of this little segment where they play fail videos. It's so stupid. Oh yeah, yeah that, there's a a lot that's bad. That they're the getting NBA they're stuff. getting cheesy. I think. Yeah. yeah, and that's just a. I know we're getting off topic. That's just a mere suggestion. Golden Knights, your some of your in-game entertainment's getting cheesy. At the same time, though, I kind of am okay with it because most of the time I don't pay attention to it. And I and I actually I go to other arenas. You, you and I, I think, are probably different than most of the fans there. I go for the hockey. I don't go for the fucking yeah. drumline and the Cirque du Soleil show. But I do enjoy that they put on a pretty good show for fans. And I think that's half the reason why that stadium's still full. Yeah, but I. I my issue is that 
A lot of what they do now, about 80% of what they're doing now, is exactly what they did in year two. It's is exactly what they did in year one. Like, there's very little change, very little stuff that's broke being right added. Now. I don't think it's broke right now. Yeah. But I agree with you. Yes, that, it's, that it's, could be it. But for it's season mundane ticket, and silly. For season ticket holders, it, it gets stale. Oh, yeah. And, but, you know, winning yeah, cures I go, all. I go to half the games you go to. Yeah. So. It, but, like, winning cures all, so as long as they're winning, nobody's going to complain. That's what I'm saying. It, it still yeah. keeps butts in the seats because I think I think if we had a bad team, a lot of those dancing and fools in the stands would be bored. Oh, yeah. No, and especially right. if prices never came down, people got other things to do. Oh, yeah. Especially on a, excuse me, on a Thursday night in February. And I, uh, I actually I wrote to my season ticket rep to complain, not necessarily about, like, in general about any of that, but I specifically complained about Sweet Caroline being played. Because it is the creepiest song in the world. is the pedophile's national anthem. I fucking hate when that song gets played. It drives me insane. I don't want to go down a road, but the pedophile's national anthem, that's an interesting take. <laughs> Neil, Neil Diamond wrote it when he was in his mid-twenties, and he wrote it about Caroline Kennedy, who was 11. Or 12. All right, fair enough. <laughs> and you know, if, if, if I think part of you is butthurt because it's uh, the Red Sox eighth inning song. Uh, that too, but when you... When you combine that, I think with, it is silly. Don't get me wrong. With the lyrics, when he's talking about holding her and like all that, and you realize he wrote it for an eleven-year-old, you're like, "Oh, come the fuck!" Did he fuck say up. that? Yes. Wow. Touching you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so goddamn creepy. <laughs> bop bop bop. Uh, yeah. All right. So Sherman thinks the seventeen game. Uh, Richard Sherman thinks the 17-game uh, proposal will ultimately lead to an 18-game proposal, which we were talking about. So there's that kind of circling back to what you were talking about six months ago. I'm reading an article here on Yahoo that was written today, actually, the 20th, or excuse me, Thursday, the 20th. Um, the the proposal I did here, like you said, with the only being able to play 16 games. If you're only if you're a football player that's only playing 16 games, I think the revenue sharing should not change. Hmm. The only thing I think the salary cap should increase to accommodate roster expansion because you're going to need another sure. quarterback. Oh yeah, you're going to need a quarterback that can play two games unless you're just willing to throw two games a year. I mean, no, no team's that good. I mean, yes, there are a couple, but yeah. I mean, let's let's be honest. If, especially if we expand to the seventeen playoffs, you know, teams four through nine are going to need competitive backup quarterbacks. That's true. And and do they play more than two games, especially when they get hurt? So what happens if? What happens if Patrick Mahomes tears an ACL in week one? Now you've got your backup quarterback that you scheduled for two games. You've got to get another one. Yeah. You've got to get another one, too, to play for that one game or the, or the, you know, the, the two games that he's going to play. It, it creates an interesting thing, but I, I think rosters got to expand, which means ultimately that the salary cap has to expand. And like I said, I'm usually with the owners on this. The salary cap expanding needs to, nothing to do with paying Patrick Mahomes $40 million or $60 million. That's not where I think the salary cap needs to expand. I think it needs to expand again. Maybe the floor needs to come up. Do you think there should be an individual player cap? Like no. a maximum contract no, like they have I, in the NBA? No, because I believe in capitalism. And if that player is worth whatever that team believes he is worth, even if it cripples the cap for that team. Again, look at Aaron Rodgers. You know, He, he demanded like $35 million, and, and Brady might be doing the same. Yep. That cripples caps. I mean, you already have a hard enough time getting people to come to Green Bay, and now there's not enough money for them. Uh, I mean, if that's if that's your end game, I mean, Emmett Smith just came out this week and said, "Hey, look, if I'm Dak Prescott, if I'm putting, if I'm trying to propose 35 million on the table, but I mean, I lose Amari Cooper, I'm going to take 28 million and leave a little bit for Amari. Sometimes, mm-hmm. and he even says, like, sometimes you've got to leave money on the table if you're interested in winning. If, yeah, big if. Well, yeah, exactly. The new, I don't want to say generation because that's a, it's a huge amount of people, but it seems like the new wave of athlete is get paid as fast as possible. And again, I don't blame them, but if you are actually committed to a winning culture like Tom Brady, I mean, look at this, look at Tom Brady. He's, he's testing free agency for the first time in his 20 year career. Yeah. You know, he was always willing to take less. Now I understand he has a different circumstance with Giselle, but he wasn't always with Giselle. Right. So I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, and it, this, with, is with this Tom Brady, pass, I guess. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, well, I I think the the difference with Tom Brady is not only did he have the wife that has always made more money than him, but he three times as much. Yeah, but he's always been the kind of guy that would say, "I will take less so that the team can improve." He wasn't doing Robert Kraft any favors. Right, he wanted yeah. that money. No, spent he wasn't like on Bob. You keep that money, he was right? Like, I want. 
Julian Edelman, Rob Gronkowski, you know, Ninkovich, you know, Jamie exactly. Collins, all these guys. Yeah. Yeah, no, I would never tell someone to give back money or leave money on the table just to appease an owner. But if if it means Amari Cooper is gone, Dak Prescott's got to strongly consider how much how much that seven million dollars is worth. Because if he goes somewhere, let's say he goes to L.A. the Chargers mm-hmm. and signs for thirty five million a year, state income tax. Yeah, you're going to be around twenty four million a year, all because you had to have thirty five million. But if you stay in Dallas and make twenty eight, there's no state income tax. You keep more money. So I don't know the math off the top of my head, but. 28 and a lot of players from Vegas say this. You know, 28 million in, in Dallas might be pretty similar to 35 million in LA. I don't know the exact number, but after taxes and all of those things because you pay because you play half your season in California because they have that jock tax and all that bullshit too. Right. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it may be like when we talk about Le'Veon Bell, it's like if it's all about the money, just sign with Miami. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, no, and you're right about that. I I think the difference too is not just about the state income taxes, but also the cost of living where these places are too. True, because true. I just the first thing that came to my mind was the income. Yeah, taxes. no, it, it makes sense, and that should. But be But yes, living in a, in a in a in a because they're up in Inglewood, he, I would assume he's going to be in the hills somewhere. Yeah, and those those prices aren't cheap. But if that's if that's your thing, then you know what? The, if your thing is lifestyle, then money, those kind of money totals won't matter. But again, I, I, who knows? Uh, yeah, I think I think it'll get approved. I just. Uh, that's just the uh, the 17 game season. Um, we talked about. I think the 17 game season will get approved. I just don't know what's in it for the players. And the only thing in it, because it, it's not technically, it, it is an extra game, but now they've got less time to get ready for the season too. When do you put the When do you put the the starters yeah. in in preseason? Week two? Because usually they were they were going in in week three or week you know week two they were playing a drive. You know, now what do you do? Now how do you prepare for the season? Yeah, they uh, they're gonna have to figure that out. You know, every team is going to have to figure out how they want to do it. If it's starting the OTAs earlier, if it's starting, uh, I mean, are the owners trying to make this a year-round sport? Uh, I mean, it's getting pretty close to that. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, well, you still have seven months off uh, of actual football. I yes, mean, yes, it's a year-round sport in the news cycle. In the news cycle, for sure. But I mean, you know. For most teams, the season ends in December, and then you know the players they don't like just to sit on the, they don't sit on the couch for, and do nothing for six months. Like they're all working Marcus out. Russell did. Well, it was, it was, <laughs> I mean, you know, these guys are working out. They're hitting trainers. You know, they're working with uh, you know coaches. Like you know, sure, but the money shit. they're paid is a year-round salary. It's sure. different than like the XFL. People are like, oh, you know, people are like. These totals, you know, the, what they're getting paid fifty thousand dollars is chump change. But yeah, they're getting paid fifty thousand dollars for a ten week season. Yeah, you know, what I mean, that's a little different. But these guys are getting paid, even if you're making four hundred and fifty k, which I think is the league minimum. Uh, you're still in the top echelon of people of, of earners in America. Oh, for sure. So you you still have you're still getting paid enough money to to not be forced to work in the off season. You you are you are not. Required to continue staying in shape, I guess is what I'm what I'm saying. Yeah. But they do that because, well, one, they don't need another job, so all you're going to do is sit there and you know get fat and happy. So you do that almost to trick yourself. I could be wrong. I don't know. I I, I don't know that the owners want it to be a year-round league uh, for the players, but they definitely enjoy the fact that they're in the news cycle all year because that yes. you know as no news is bad talking, news. yeah. And, you know, people are going to buy up jerseys and everything else in the off season when most of these teams aren't getting any other well, that Plus, March, we have free agency, so they're going to start buying jerseys. Then we have the draft in April, yeah. May and June. I think we have late cuts in June, and then OTA start in July. So you really have May. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I mean, February have the Super Bowl, and you have the rest of the month off. But we still have all that, you know, uh, what do you call it, free agent speculation right now. Oh yeah, and everybody, and we still got what three weeks before free agents can actually sign anywhere. Yeah, I think it's somewhere around maybe St. more Patty's Day. Yeah. So uh, now, if the players' association barks at the playoff schedule, I will know it's all agreed on their part too, mm. because we are expanding playoffs now. 
The only beef I think the players can have is that the two seeds now losing their bye. Now let me break it down in case you've been living under a rock. The proposed format is that we will have seven teams from each conference now making the playoffs with the one seed, the, conf- uh, the, the best seed, uh, best seeded team in each conference receiving the bye. I would assume two plays seven, three plays six, and four plays five. Three teams advancing, and I would assume I don't, I don't have all of the information in front of me. I would assume one it would get reseeded to one the one seed playing the worst the, the lowest available seed. You would think that they would keep that formula, <clears> but you know. Now, who knows? It's, if they're know, reworking Baseball's everything. looking at picking opponents. I, I would be interested if football would do that, too. Yeah. I love it. We didn't talk about that. We will talk about I, I, well, We're talking about the Astros, but I want to chat about that, too, because we we uh, highlighted, I'll say, the – what was it? What, what league was that? Southern Professional Hockey League. SPHL. Yes. We highlighted their attempt to do it, and I don't know if you ever followed up on that, if it was successful or not. Uh, apparently the fans loved it, and they are still doing it. So I can't imagine that they've uh, they've gotten rid of it, rid of it as of yet. So even though I'm about to make a completely 100% false statement, I know Rob Manfred was listening to the Vegas Squares podcast yes. when we highlighted the Southern he Professional Hockey League. Like, I I know for a fact nobody he else was. is talking about it. So. <laughs> exactly, that's true. That's that is true. Uh, but the new NFL playoffs, yay or nay for you? It has benefits and drawbacks. I don't love the fact that these two seeds are losing their bye. I think that was um, because usually you're winning a division, and you're usually one of you know the four best teams throughout the regular season. Yeah. And with football, with the uh, let's say abuse that you take over the course of the year, uh, you deserve that bye. But if we do get to an 18 game season with two bye weeks, I'm okay with them losing their bye. So it's 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 tomato tomato here. Yeah, I I I I would prefer that they kept the bye for the two seed. Although having a seven team playoff doesn't isn't conducive to that kind of thing. Right, it would have to go to an eight. Yeah, it would have to go eight, or it would have to be double bye for the one seed. One, two, and three get buys, so that way four, uh, four, five, six, seven play each other in the first like round. Five teams then. And then it would have to be five, double. It would have so to be, double, have to be buy. double buy for yeah. the yeah. So, I mean, I, I understand why they're doing it because of the way that this is uh, shaking out, but I would prefer having that two seed have the buy because those top two teams have earned the spot to be the top two teams, therefore they should get the benefit of having the rest before the playoffs start. Correct. Now, the only other thing I can say is if you've spent the first of an 18-game schedule, if you spent the first 16 games with your quarterback and you go 14-2 and two like the Ravens did, uh, you're, you probably will keep the bye if you go 14-4 and four with your backup. I don't, I, I don't know. But Maybe I mean that it, it certainly makes things different. Yeah, I uh, it, it creates more strategy. It makes the coaches earn their paychecks a little bit more. Yes. Um, on face value, again, I, I haven't dissected all of this. On face value, I'm okay with more teams in the playoffs, and I know many people say, "Well, hockey and basketball do it; it dilutes it." Maybe with basketball, but I don't agree with hockey. For sixteen teams, no, it's sixteen team. I'm playoffs okay. are amazing. Yeah, I'm okay with I'm okay with a playoff system that doesn't reward half the teams. And I know that that eliminates baseball or basketball and hockey. As long as you keep a 50% or less ratio of teams making it, which when Seattle comes, they will fall back to 50%. Um, the only thing with hockey is, you know, we talk about the puck luck and et cetera and things like that. I mean, look at last year. What, six lower seeds advanced? Yeah, in the playoffs in the first round. Yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. rarely happens in basketball. Again, I think and both, basketball. both number one seeds in hockey got eliminated in the first round. That, that is true. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I know that's not common, but at least I feel like we get better playoff matchups in the first round. It might be the best playoff week or week and a half in any sport. Yeah, is that first round match? You know, you got eight matchups of of teams who are not generally too far apart from each other. Like. Talent-wise, Tampa was supposed to wipe the floor with Columbus. Well, we all see what happened there. Um, I'm okay with the expansion, even if we stick with a 16-game schedule. I mean, it's more teams competitive. Yep. More teams, maybe more deals at the deadline, maybe more more situations where you know we don't have as many ga- as many Carolina Washington games that we don't give a fuck about. 
in week 16 and week 17. We may have a game. We may have more games like the Dallas Eagles, you know, you win or go home kind of game. Yeah. But at the same time, we may have less because you may have a situation with that extra spot. I think Dallas would have made it this year. Either Dallas or the Rams would have made it this year. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it's... It, so that, that game might not have meant as much. That game, maybe not, but another game maybe does. Sure. When you're fighting for that last seed or, you know, if it's, you know... Because I think, I think the Steelers and the Rams would have made the playoffs last year under that proposed format. Yeah. Uh, and the but, buys would have gone to the Ravens and the 49ers. And as I'm looking at this, I realize the SPHL did switch back to a different no. one one plays eight, two plays seven standard playoff format. Scared by Yeah, I don't know what uh, what prompted the change, but they are. I, I would hope that no the change anymore. wasn't prompted by butthurt feelings. Because I, I can see in today's generation, you know, they think we stink. Why did they pick us? I would hope that's not the case. I, I, I would hope so as well. I mean, if anything, like, you know, let's say you're the number one team, and instead of picking number eight, you pick number six. Right. Well, for number six, we're going to – I'm not going to say, like, you know, they think that we're the easiest team to beat. I'm going to say, all right, fuck you. Yeah. We're going Well, after. that's my thought yeah. too. But I can see in this kind of this crying culture that – you know, uh, they might get a little butt hurt that they were the ones that the number one seed thought was the. I, I, I doubt that's. I said I doubt that's the case. I just hope it's not the case. Yeah, is what I'm saying well, maybe. Uh, so I, I guess I never really <laughs> asked you. So are you yay or nay in this? With seven games? for the seven? Yeah, I. I don't know. I I I've been going back and forth on it ever since I heard about it. Like. I do like the expansion. I do. I don't. I mean, it is another week of playoff football. Too. Yeah, and I. I don't think it waters down the the playoff pool at all. Like it creates I, another important week of football. Yeah, no preseason. I, I don't. You know, anybody that gets in, even as a seventh seed, deserves to be there. So, I like it to that extent. But you know, the flip side is, you know, it, it, it's such a weird number having seven teams, and in the NFL there are. We've already seen bad teams make the playoffs, uh, especially teams with losing records make the playoffs, and that always kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Right. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I would rather see it if they're going to change the way the playoff format is done. Aside from winning a division plus two wild cards, I would rather them just get rid of the division. Well, that's what I was about to say. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the the, the poor teams who made it yeah, win the, their division? Yeah, and that that was always the thing. So that's why I'm thinking... Just the best you know, seven teams. Best seven teams from the AFC, from best the seven teams from regardless. the NFC. Yeah, because if you look at it, uh, Pittsburgh would have got in this year at 8-8. Eight and eight. So still five hundred, and, yep. and LA would have gotten in at nine, nine and seven. seven. Yeah. So you know these are. So you still had five hundred or better this year. Yeah. So you know they're good teams, but still not great, and that's kind of the problem with you know in the NBA, in the NHL, teams that are making it into the playoffs, even if they're at about five hundred, they're usually like. They're not usually that low. They're usually much higher. In the NFL, you're much more likely to see a team that's at 500 or below uh, in that kind of 7th, 8th, ninth seed type range mm-hmm. and just kind of backdoor their way in. Which Well, and the question is, is if, yeah. if we go to your proposal, top seven teams regardless, Philadelphia doesn't host a playoff game. Yeah. Well, they may down the line, I think. I don't know between Philadelphia and L.A. who would have had the tiebreaker. But those two teams would have been the six and seven seeds instead of the fourth seed and out of the playoffs. So, in in that situation, it may have been because uh, they won know, a division. Because they, get, they won a division, they get the higher. Yeah, they, they get the six. They they get the better that's seed. That's their tiebreaker. Yeah. Okay, so, that, that's fair. And then you look at I don't know again I don't know the tiebreakers, but if you just took the, if you if you didn't give that as a tiebreaker, Buffalo may have hosted that wild card against Houston. Ah. And that may have been beneficial to them. Sure, playing in that weather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, I, you know, maybe it's it's not a per. I, and that's the problem with today's instant gratification. We want when something is proposed to be perfect. Yeah. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just gotta work out kinks. But they're on a stage where their trial runs are NFL football games. Yep. So as much as the NFL can go fuck itself, when they come out with a plan to try to make the game better, 
The only way they can test that, they don't have a minor league system. True. Now, they could test that in the XFL, but they've been very adamant that they're separate entities. Uh, but, yeah, they got to test it. They got to test it in the regular season. They got to test it when games matter. Yeah, they got to test it somewhere and try something. And, yeah. You know, they can't even use the CFL as an example just because there are so few teams in that league. They're right. so, you know, and they're so separate. Plus, you know, obviously they have that fucking one point play with the punts going through the end zone or whatever it is. So it's a, it's such a different game that you can't even really relate the two. I was just looking on the NFL.com. The new CBA proposal will include. The option for the future game, 17-game schedule, and if the 17-game schedule is approved, it will increase the player revenue from 47% to 48.5%. So they're not quite 50-50, but it would get an increase for that one game. I mean, I don't know the numbers, you know, the math off the top of my head. If 1.5% increase is is worth another game, it sounds probably like it is in terms of those dollars. But That's interesting. I'm all for more teams in a postseason in the NFL. Yeah, it, it's the only. It, Not sure we can go higher though, though. Yeah, it, and that's kind of the problem is that once you get to seven, maybe eight, then you start really, you know, dredging the bottom of the canal, so to speak, to try to find teams that are worthy to make the playoffs. Well, yeah, like, I mean, it, you look it, at eight Eight teams would have been Denver at 7 and 9, yeah. or Vegas. Actually, it would have been Denver because they had the higher ranking. And Chicago at 8 and 8 in the NFC. Yeah, and that, you know... At, and let's look at Chicago and Denver. They were not good teams. They very much were not good teams. So, But, that, again, that, you, that get, sort of you get failing. the Joe Flacco method, you know, and you yeah. get in the playoffs, anything can happen. That's true, but, you know... But do we want seven and, you know, seven and nine teams winning a Super Bowl? Failing upwards is not something that should be rewarded. It's fair. That, that is true. Uh, and especially because... We only have 16, 17, 18 games. Every game matters more when you have less teams make the playoffs. I agree. I think that's a a huge, a huge thing. Whereas I think I like MLB's proposal to do the exact same thing because over 162 games, that's a different. You have trends. You have you know you have injuries. Yep. Uh, Games mean. Games don't necessarily, they're supposed to mean more, but they don't because you play so many of them. Yeah, you're playing every day. So. Yeah, you play ten times the number of games as football. Yeah. So, I don't know. It'd be interesting. Speaking of baseball, let's let's transition over. All right. You'll appreciate that segue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the last topic we'll touch here. Um, actually, we've got two topics. I'll, I'll, I'll throw this in uh, because it's a Boston story. David Ortiz is obviously in the media again, but not for something Boston related. Yeah. He, uh, has decided to speak his mind on the Astros cheating scandal situation. And, uh, he took a turn that part of me expects, part of me kind of expected him to say, but I still was a little shocked by it. Uh, first of all, I know you've, probably followed this on the surface level. So I'll get your thoughts on the Astros cheating scandal and the the whistleblower, as you could say, Mike Fires, who now plays for the Athletics, who was a part of that uh, 17 championship team. What is your thoughts, uh, just overall, so, for the sport, for... For the guys on the team, you know, who didn't get punished, the guys in the management who did get fired, you know, so yeah. every, I'll just, I'll just, I'll a blank check here for you. So I, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about this and try to compare it to the steroid era, and I think that that's sort of a misnomer, just because with steroids, number one, it wasn't entire organizations; it was individual players, and number two, we could tell. I mean, we could see guys. You know, ballooning up. We could see heads exploding. We could see these types of changes in players. You could see a guy who hit 12 home runs all of a sudden hit 45. Right. Brady so Anderson. We <laughs> Looking at you. So we knew what was going on. Nobody wanted to do anything about it because it was good Creating for the game. Creating dollars, yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. Ch- chicks dig the long ball. We all remember yeah, that I commercial. Remember that, yeah. So, you know, that sort of thing. I, I don't think it's fair to compare it with this when it was an entire organization for multiple years using not only technology like technology with the, the buzzer on the chest, but also the banging the of the videos and the banging and like everything about it was so organized, it was so conspiratorial 
and it affected not only outcomes of games, which obviously steroids did too, but this was to a much larger extent, but it also affected player careers. Well, especially with steroids, you still had to hit the ball. You still had to know what pitch was coming. Exactly, yeah. And if you, if you could put a guy on steroids and he knows what pitch is coming, good God. Yeah, oh yeah, we're seeing 100 home run seasons, if that's the case. Minimum. So, you know, for these guys, it was just such a big uh, organizational advantage day in and day out for as long as they did it. Yeah, I mean, was. they went World Series title, ALCS, World Series appearance. Yeah, and so... Yeah, that's hard to do. For me, that makes it so much, like, significantly... Like, to me, this is probably a close number two in all-time worst scandals in sports history. Well, at least Major League Baseball history behind the Black Sox. Black Sox yeah. Actually throwing games. Mm-hmm. Like, Pete Rose, to me, like, everybody wants to vilify Pete Rose. Pete Rose, to me, did nothing wrong. Even though he bet if, on games... If he did not bet on... If it's confirmed that he did not bet on his own games, I agree with you. Well, even betting on his own games, he says he always bet, bet on to win. To win. Yes. At which point, he's not throwing games. He's trying, like, fuck to win. Sure. In which case, I don't think that's a hindrance. I, I don't still think... have the small problem of betting on your own games. But, again, I just so, yeah. short short snippet, I believe Pete belongs in the hall. Yeah, and... He's going to get in posthumously, and that sucks. Yeah, and, and I, I think everybody said that, although Manfred just said that that's probably not going to happen, but, you know, fuck him. I mean, dude. Everything changes, and he's probably put him in and put a, put a, put that big ass asterisk. On yeah. Hey, the guy bet on baseball. He was denied entry for I think we're going on forty years here. Maybe actually probably less, but still. But anyway, back to yeah, back yeah. to your Astros. So for the Astros, for me, it, it is you know, pardon the pun, but astronomical the level of cheating here. The That's amount. So bad. <laughs> Everything that got affected, every player that got affected, everything about, like... And I mean, people got demoted. Uh, the guy, uh, I don't know his name, but he played for the Blue Jays. Yep. Uh, after a, a, he gave up, like, six or seven runs, he got demoted and cut. Yeah. And I mean, you cost that guy money. I'm not saying he, I'm not saying he would have been spectacular, but... He, well, he never made it back to the bigs. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, he's, he's suing for way more than he would have earned, but hey, take a shot. Well, know? that's the thing. He, he, Sue he, high, settle low. He's suing, and he said he doesn't want a dime of that money. He wants it to go to charitable organizations. Oh, I didn't see he, that. he is doing this to prove a point. Like, fuck you guys for doing this in the first place. Pay for it. Well, and that's the thing. You know, I, I can understand Ortiz's, because at the first thing, you know, you, you, you have the locker room code. I understand that. Because Ortiz does make a point here. This is this is where I have an issue, and I have an issue with Fires and all of the Astros. Uh, and I'll quote him here. Oh, after you make your money, after you get your ring, you then decide to talk about it. All of a sudden, then it's a guilt that's weighing on you. Why didn't you talk about it during that season or the season after that when it was going on? Why don't you say, I don't want to be a part of this uh, organization? You look like a snitch. Now, I can understand why players would say that. Even players who aren't on the Astros. I can, I can get that. You know, because I have a problem now currently, I think, and I'll just I'll throw this out here and we can trickle down from it. I think the Astros should lose their title. And if it comes out the Red Sox were doing the exact same thing, they should lose it too. Uh, but the problem is they're keeping their title. Yeah. They're keeping their playoff bonuses. Yeah, and that they're keeping yeah. all their postseason accolades. I think George Springer won MVP, and I think uh, Altuve won ALCS MVP. They're keeping all of these things, and all they really had to do was go sit in a press conference and take a beating for thirty minutes. Yeah. So what you're telling me, Rob Manfred, is that the juice was worth the squeeze. Yeah, and I, I think for me, you know. I, the fact that they're keeping the the fact that they're keeping the title is doesn't necessarily bother me. Like you can put the asterisk there, but you if you vacate the problem is that MLB doesn't want to vacate it because hundred years later we still talk about the Black Sox. Oh yeah. If you leave the Astros in there, even if you put an asterisk, we probably talk about it less a hundred years later. Sure. For, Not you and I specifically, but baseball yeah. historians. So. And, and that's why I kind of don't have a problem with it because you know for the I think future of the game to, to have that yeah uh, as for the a legacy for the future of the game that makes sense to me it's the fact that they're not making the players forfeit their playoff bonuses I think that at a minimum is the right punishment for these players 
going forward in or in instead of just saying, Oh yeah, they took a beating from the media, they feel bad, this is where it ends. Like the scary thing would be is if you took away those bonuses. I mean guys like Altuve and, 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 and George Springer and, and, and others shouldn't have a problem paying them back because they still have that kind of money. But I don't know anybody on the team. Let's just say there was a guy on the team and he's out of baseball and he's blown the money. What does he do? Yeah. Is he and, now in debt? Well and, and I mean that I, I, maybe that maybe the club has to write one in his name. And I, I think you put it as a stipulation of uh, you don't bargaining. You don't play another game until this is paid back. So if the guy's out of baseball, maybe he just doesn't no, give a he's fuck. Out of baseball, yeah, yeah forever. Um, so you put the stipulation on it that you can't play until this is paid off. And I'm gonna start putting that on stipulations of people I play fantasy football. With. There you go. <laughs> you can't set your lineup until you're paid. <laughs> We had a guy in our in our in our big league this year that it took like 15 weeks to get the money from him. So oh yeah, that's, God. that's garbage. Yeah, no, um, that shit drives me crazy. Uh, and then you have Rob, Rob Manfred who came up and sat down and really offered nothing uh, in the way of explanation. It's hard to let these. It's hard. I, I can see yes taking away the postseason accolades, but the team does the team have the trophy? Uh, the team keep the trophy. Because Rob Manfred seemed to say, oh. well, it's just a piece of tin or a piece of metal. And that set off a lot of players. A lot of players like, what are we playing for if it's just a piece of metal? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't. He kind of put his foot in his mouth with that one. Is that, I mean, that... If you walk through a stadium tour of, of Minute Maid Park, are they, is that going to be there? Because when I, when I went to Fenway uh, just recently, a couple of years ago, they had all uh, eight. The, the World Series things are only the four of them. Yeah. But uh, they had the, the league titles, whatever. They, they looked pretty puny back in the back in the teens but uh, they had all of their trophies there and they took all of the spectators by them so i think this is houston's first title if i'm not mistaken i think you're right you take it away from them you got to uh, I mean, yeah. you may let them say oh we're still world series champions with the asterisks but yeah you know they can hang the banners but you take the trophy away put a big, at, big put a big asterisk on the banner yeah <laughs> speaking of i saw a t-shirt on uh, wherever on the internet that did have the houston logo Instead of the uh, whatever that is in the middle, it was an asterisk, and they said the Houston asterisks. <laughs> I like so that. So speaking of puns, I thought yeah, that was a good one, too. That, that, that's pretty good. Uh, the other question, the fallout, we'll move into Boston here, uh, is Alex Cora got fired. Yep. And because he was led to be, that we were led to believe that he was the mastermind. Yes. Well, now that time has played out, it turns out that he and Carlos Beltran weren't as much of masterminds as we originally thought. Right. So, obviously, John Henry and the Red Sox can't go back, but I'm thinking Alex Cora might have lost his job, and Carlos Beltran the same, um, should, that they should not have lost their jobs. The, yes, I think, no. I think we're going to get the, the Red Sox swept under the rug regardless. Yeah. I don't think baseball wants two their last two World Series champions, well, except the Nationals. Two of their last three World Series champions to have asterisks. On them. Yeah, so I, I think with I, I think with the fallout of this, even if they weren't the instigators, even if they weren't as big a part of it, I still think that firing them makes sense in the sense that there was fallout coming. The team didn't know what was going to happen if these guys were going to get suspended for a full year or whatever else. Right. So I mean, I, these things dragged on into spring training, right? Now. So they they either had to coach or not coach. So I, or I find a new coach. Yeah, and I, I think firing them made sense at the time. You're right that these teams can't go back and rehire them, but I think this bodes well for these guys in the future. Like my dad and I were talking about this, and we were trying to figure out if Alex Cora and Carlos Beltran would even be able to get jobs in baseball. After all this, Cora and, maybe Beltran. I think is gonna have a real hard time. Yeah, Beltran definitely. Cora at least has the. I, I believe it was the all-time single-season record for the Red Sox wins. So even if possible, because yeah. even if it was found that they were doing all the things that the Astros are doing, he still has to navigate them. Yeah, and he's still you know he's still got that title, and you know they correct. And that's kind of the thing. Anybody, coaching experience. Anybody that's going to hire him is going to a look at the coaching experience, and b they can't know how many extra games he won because of these cheating scandals. So therefore, he has the experience. They have he has maybe what they're looking for. So they're going to be able to hire him. That being and, said, neither I believe neither of these two coaches' next jobs, and maybe even AJ Hinge too, will be an 
in MLB. Yeah, I, I like they completely AAA agree. Guy. AAA or college or something like that. Yeah. Or if they do get in MLB, it definitely won't be as the manager. It could no. be like bench coach, yeah. first base coach, third base. It's like something along those lines, just kind of in the background, in the shadows a little bit. Yeah, but uh, base coaches, I would, I believe, could be dangerous for a team because you know fans have no mercy. That is true. <laughs> that, that's very true. Uh, so, you know, it, it, that sort of thing I could see. And even Carlos Beltran, even though he doesn't have the experience that Cora does, I still think that there are enough questions about his exact involvement and everything else that it's not going to hinder his ability to get I one of these not. jobs I later on. Not. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I, I, the, the question is, is you know, you talk about punishing the players, and yes, I believe the, pun- the players should have some sort of punishment. It seems like they're going to get off scot free. Like I said, the juice was obviously worth the squeeze. Yep. The other side of that is, okay, well, if you suspend them, do you suspend them all at once for a year? Well, then the Astros don't have a team. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I think there's still seventy percent of the roster still on that team. That, that do you suspend true. them at different times? Well, I don't know if that really hurts. You know, you suspend, okay, now it's your time for your 20-game suspension. Now it's your time. Uh, what should happen should have been, yes, a monetary revocation of of postseason bonuses and also uh, if you want to leave the World Series title up with an asterisk, that's fine, but who was the World Series MVP? He was a cheater. You know, yeah. George Springer, he was a cheater. You know, Justin Verlander, he was a cheater. You know, and if they go into the Hall of Fame, look, they got he's got a World Series to his name. He cheated during that World Series. That he did, and that's because uh, ultimately, yes, have to live with. if you believe Lunau and Hinch, which I don't for a second, that they knew nothing, and maybe the owner didn't know anything, but he didn't do himself any favors with his press conference. Oh yeah, uh, the city is embarrassed. Oh, I don't sure. think the city should be embarrassed with these guys. All the accolades they receive for the rest of their life. They're the ones that should be embarrassed, just like Pete Rose. So when this team takes the field at Minute Maid Park, do you think the home fans boo? Do they cheer? Do cheer. They, they cheer. Yeah. They, they kept everything. They still got a World Series title. Nothing, yeah. nothing goes away. They cheer. Okay. But every other stadium they go to, they get booed. Oh, they're going to get booed mercilessly. Well, I mean, as mercilessly as they can with like 4,000 fans sitting in the seats in Miami. But <laughs> it's true. Boo! <laughs> El boo! <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, I'm getting racist. Yeah. That, uh, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we'll close it up here with the close up this story. There is a William Hill prop. Ah, okay. Number of hit batsmen for the Astros in 2020. The total was set at 83.5. It has come down to 81.5. Okay. Interesting. You got 100 bucks. Where are you going? Uh, I'm probably going under. Keep in mind, without the scandal, they were hit 67 times last year. Right. I I just I don't think there's going to be the targeting of these batters uh, that people seem to think. I think like, there might be strategic timing. If you're planning on intentionally walking somebody, just being the fucking yeah, guy. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to see a little bit of that, but I don't think it's going to be enough to push it over the top and over that number. I, it's I, funny. When I when I saw I it at 83, I thought the under two. But as it came down two points, yeah. I think just margin of error with this situation, if they got 67 the last year, I could see 15. 15 more, more bangs. Uh, some, some players, if they, they're saying, you're going to get a five-game suspension. Well, pitchers don't pitch that often. That's true. So a five-game suspension to a pitcher is really, especially a starter, that's one game. Yeah. And if the coach is, like, worth it, you're going to bang them. Especially Yankees, Nationals. Because you know they were they were doing it during this World Series, too, and they lost. Oh, of course. They lost all their home games. Yeah, which is ridiculous. They lost all their home games. So, I mean, if they told me they weren't doing it in 2019, I may believe them because they literally lost all their home games. Uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> Or they still, couldn't figure out the I, national signals. I, I, I can't get over that. I, and credit to the Nationals for being able to pull that off. In, if that's the case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, that's just wow. Yeah. No, I, yeah I, I, I still feel comfortable with the under because I, I think there are enough players that either say that they don't care or that they don't feel that the um, the the players were like, if the manager is saying we are doing this, you have to get on board. Then, you know, how much of that can you really blame on the players? Right. 
Uh, so I, I think there. You are mean going, the Astros? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think there are going to be enough of the pitchers on other teams that get on board that say, maybe this guy was just following orders. But if you actually, I mean, we didn't talk about fires, and I don't want to let him off the hook. Yeah. And I know we're running close to an hour here. Uh, if you weren't on board with it, you know, he seemed rather. They, they look back on you know the the videos, and he seemed rather happy to win that World Series title. If you were not on board with it in 2017, don't you just request a trade? Hey, look, I don't like what you're doing. Let, if you guys want to do it, fine. Let me out. Or, or why don't you snitch then? Yeah, I mean that, that's the thing. He, he got all his bone. He's not getting punished either. He's he's a martyr now. Yeah, I mean, he, no, he's not dead, but you know what I mean. Yeah, he, you know he. If he felt that bad about it, then yeah, I definitely think he should have spoken up earlier. And that's what you know, circling back. That's what David Ortiz said. Hey, look, if you felt so bad about it, you're you're a snitch now. You waited two years to come out with this. Now that you're on a different team, you took all of the glory and the bonuses and uh you decided to then snitch on the guys and maybe something went bad in houston that made him snitch maybe, maybe he wanted to resign there or he wanted some money and they told him to go fuck himself and he's like well, <laughs> you know and especially since he went to a team now in oakland who was in houston's division yeah so i don't know uh all right let's wrap it up here one last uh, thought uh, we've got a uh, big boxing match in vegas this weekend i know you don't follow boxing but who are you going to take wilder versus fury Two. Last one was a draw. Last one. Oh wow! How often do you see draws in boxing? I think the draw was set up to, for the for the rematch. That's my personal opinion. Gotcha. Okay. But if you had to break down the boxing, Wilder knocked down Fury twice, but Fury led the charge. So I can see the draw, split decision draw. So there there was something that I heard on the radio on the way over here, which I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was happening. But apparently, some refs after a guy gets knocked down, they're doing something that they're calling a sobriety test. Mm-hmm. So instead of just a guy getting up, they give him the standing A count and they say, "Can you go?" The boxer says yes. Then they go. The refs now saying, "All right, look to the left, look to the right, look up, look at you know, like making them follow commands so that they can make sure that the player is or that the boxer is fine." Which Actually, ready to go back and then I, just I, saying yes. Yeah, exactly. So I I get that to a point of player safety, but the guy that I was listening to made a really good point that I hadn't thought about. That like, look. The guy got knocked down. The point of boxing is to knock your opponent down. If he is weak, the ref stepping in to give him more of a chance to recover is unfair to the boxer who knocked him down in the first place. I could see that. So I was like, that. We're so concerned about brain injuries nowadays. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of the part. Even the, when the you knowingly step in a ring. <laughs> so, you know, this is the kind of thing that I, I feel is like. It, it's Catch an, 22. It's an interesting sport position that they're putting the referees in and you know the referee doesn't want to gain the reputation of letting two boxers go Beat too far yeah. so uh, it's kind of a catch-22 for them uh but yeah i i think that in this kind of a fight if it was a draw last time i think it's going to be whoever comes out with the hot hand early uh and you know tries to to set the tone and set the pace and if you know one of these guys does it and obviously i don't follow boxing but I feel like that's the way that you kind of get under the other guy, make him get off his game plan, make mistakes, because yeah. you know, it's the old Mike Tyson saying that everybody has a game plan until they get punched in the mouth. Very, very true. I, uh, I watched the first fight. I, I didn't have it a draw. I thought Wilder won, so I think um, I'm going with Wilder again. I caught him at minus 120. He's up to minus 130. Oh, so wow. I saved the dime there. So I am on... Uh, I am on Wilder. Wilder, so, okay. Uh, I might look at that and tell you because you know I'll just get some action on it. Yeah. Maybe I'll jinx you. Have a little fun with it. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing I do have in there is um, I have Fury at knockouts in the fifth, sixth, seventh rounds because they were the biggest odds of. Um, excuse me, fourth, fifth, and sixth rounds. They were biggest. They were the biggest odds of direct uh, endings to the fight for Fury. Interesting. Yeah, okay. I think uh, fourth was like twenty to one. Fifth was like twelve to one, and 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 six was ten to one. So, because I don't think he's going to knock him out, but if he does, I'm hoping he does it in that window. Yeah. So, anyways, all right. Well, that's going to be uh, it for us. Thank the sponsors because we forgot to thank them in the beginning. Oh shit! Yeah. Oh yeah, because I was. On <laughs> you were Mike one. one. Yeah. Uh, forgot that we had sponsors. <laughs> Seat Giant promo code twelve ounce sports discounted sporting events theater and concert tickets. Head on over to SeatGiant.com. Make sure you put that promo code in one two O Z sports. And also, obviously, 
12 Ounce Sports is one of our sponsors where you can catch us every weekend. Uh, you can catch us both radio version and on their Zingo TV version, which is available on most streaming apps. I haven't been able to find it yet, so I'll have to get the boss to tell me where it's at. I hear he said it's on the Fire Stick, so I'll have to check that one. Oh, nice. All right. I'm going to uh, look for that. So check us out at Zingo TV, Z-I-N-G-O TV. We are on there as well. Again, we appreciate you listening. Uh, for Spike on mic two. <laughs> <laughs> I've been demoted. <laughs> I am Aaron. We are... Uh, We'll catch you on the next one.